Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, I'm uh, just to disappoint you before I start, I'm not going to do very much on the four leakage strategies. You're going to hear about those uh, in different di presentations throughout the day. So, uh, I'm going to really concentrate on the standard water balance and performance measures and comparative leakage performance measures. Um, is that right? So, uh, the sort of things I'll do is covering like how do we actually measure our leakage. Like somebody once said to me, there isn't a big dial on the wall when you come into the office which says leakage. Uh, a one simple like pressure sensor out there or a flow sensor or something which tells you leakage. Actually assessing what you're losing is actually quite a complex business. So I'll cover that. Uh, then I'll move on to how do we then judge that performance? How do we compare it? And we tend to have two problems in trying to compare performance. We have a scaling issue. Simply, if we have a, a manager of a bigger system, your level of leakage will be bigger. But is that bigger, is it the amount that is that bigger, is that justified or not? And then we have the other problem that we have is what we call explanatory factors. Uh, those that have worked in a business will, uh, like, like I have, uh, going around the district offices and I would be speaking to some people and he would say, well, of course his leakage is lower because, because his pressures are lower, because he's down in the lowlands. I've got all these big mountains and I've got to get the water over the hill to the other side, so my pressure is higher, so my leakage is bound to be higher. So we then have get the issue of do we actually build in an explanatory factor in judging performance on leakage. Uh, and then I'll just quickly cover how do we use comparative and uh, performance measures in perhaps setting targets for leakage. So just as an introduction, why might you want to have some leakage, uh, compare performance on leakage? Uh, and that can be intercompany performance. So in other words, how is this company or, or authority or uh, municipality managing their leakage compared to another company or municipality? And the people that might be interested in that are the media, maybe the regulators and what have you. So for instance, uh, when the drought hit the UK, then the, the papers and the TV get very interested in your leakage figures and they're wanting you to state what your leakage uh, numbers are like and they will roll in guys from, they did in the UK, roll the guys in from New York and they said, what's your leakage? And he will say 10% and they'd say, what's your leakage? And I'd say 40%. So they'd say, well, why don't you have a word with him? He, and, that, and he'll tell you how to make it reduce your leakage. And then you get into all the problems is, which we'll cover on, why you shouldn't use percentages. <laughs> um, and, but you can't, it's very difficult to explain a, to a guy on the other side of the table who is a totally non-expert not to use percentages. Um, and then you might be interested in uh, comparing your performance uh, between your, your colleagues in other, in other companies or utilities and saying, what's your level compared to my level? Oh, you must be doing it better than I am. Why? And it, they're sort of benchmarking exercise to help you improve your performance. Then within the company itself, you might be interested to compare performance between one area compared to another area. That might help you with resource allocation. He's doing better because you've given him more active leakage control resources. You need to move some of the resources about, that type of thing. Now, we've, the main thing is uh, uh, what we call the standard IWA water balance. That's been thought up primarily by Alan Lambert um, about near 2000. So we're talking about 18 years ago. Uh, when, when people started on this business, one of the first things you find is that everybody in every different utility around the whole world calculates their water balance differently. And 
uh, at one stage, uh, Ken had a presentation which he called the cheat sheet, which was where different people allocated use into different little water box, into boxes to try and explain leakage away and pretend it wasn't leakage and we give it a different name. So I think the Americans used to say, because we knew we'd got so many mains bursts, we actually make allowance for an average flow rate and we knock that out of the water balance. We don't pretend it's leakage anymore because we know about them. Well, ridiculous. And then, and then the, the other infamous one was unaccounted for water and we didn't have a standard definition for unaccounted for water so we've banned the use of unaccounted for water in the Water Loss Task Force group. So this is the uh, standard water balance which we would fully recommend everybody uses. And basically it starts with, I don't know how to do this, not a chance. Um, starts with system input volume, uh, which is the water, generally speaking, coming out of your treatment works but it may also include water coming in from, uh, you may buy water in from another uh, water producer or another water utility, adjacent water utility. So it's water that's going into your network, system input volume. Then you have authorised consumption. So basically that, that can be split between authorised consumption, that is the water taken by your customers which you know about, you're metered, etc. So, um, and then the remaining part is are your water losses. Now, the authorised consumption can be split into two parts. One is build. So, in other words, that's what, uh, water that's being used by your customers for which you are billing and therefore you're getting income. There may be un unbilled but authorised consumption. Uh, some countries you go to, uh, perhaps the government buildings or the military or some, some parts of the organisation uh, are actually allowed to take water off the system free of charge. For a typical one is firefighting. They can take water off the system. It's uh, unbilled, but it's authorised. So that type of thing. And then we normally split water losses between apparent losses, which are... Uh, sometimes referred to as um, uh, uh, the, the sort of things where you are, uh, you've got errors in your billing system, you've got errors in your metering, so that you're not actually recovering the amount of water that is being given to customers. Uh, illegal connections and theft are a typical example. And then you've got real losses, that's the real physical losses on your system, which uh, Ken has mentioned in the first session, that's where you're actually losing water and that's the primary aim of leakage control. And then there are subsets of that, uh, which I won't go through, um, but primarily one of the areas which is most commonly used in a, a lot of organisations uh, is the split between revenue water and non-revenue water. So uh, you'll see that the actual part which is only revenue water, that's the amount of water you're supplying to your customers for which you get money, is the top part, and then the bottom part is non-revenue water. And in a lot of countries around the world, there might be uh, that the concern really is non-revenue water because quite often that boundary between apparent losses and real losses is is quite difficult to define and, and the two are joined together and quite often concession contracts are, are issued by regulators with the basis of performance to do with non-revenue water, not just on physical losses. So what, how do we work out um, what our leakage figure is? We talk, do a top-down uh, top water balance, we take our water produced and our imports and that gives us our system import uh, volume. We might have exports so we knock off exports. That gives us our distribution system input volume. We have got our build use, not household and non-household. We've got, may have, uh, 
unbilled but unmeasured use. Uh, some countries, uh, the UK in particular, but Canada, there's a lot, large sections of the users, generally speaking domestic, and may not be metered. So you may not actually get a, an actual uh, measured volume for them. So you estimate that. Uh, you have uh, a un unbilled authorized use. And then you have basically that's your and uh, an allowance for apparent losses. And you have got top down, uh, what we call the top down leakage. So you've now got an estimate of what your losses are. Then we now have a, a concept of actually measuring leakage. We're quite unique in terms of being able to estimate our, where we, how much water we lose. If you go to companies such as Marks and & Spencers and, and supermarkets and things like that, they just have one measure of their wastage. They measure how many baked, cans of baked beans they buy from the supplier, and they measure how many cans of baked beans they, they sell across the counters. Subtract the one from the other, and that gives them their wastage of baked beans. Uh, that's equivalent to our top-down total integrated flow water balance. But we are quite unique in that what, what you notice is that, generally speaking, most people go to bed at night. So when they go to bed at night, this, we're excluding the students and, and things like that. Um, so generally speaking, most people go to bed at night. When they go to bed at night, they don't use water. So what we do we find is that the demand on the system drops dramatically at night. We have this very low flow in the middle of the night. We can actually use that. We believe most of that will be leakage. And we can use that as another way of estimating leakage. And that's often called the, the night flow method of assessing leakage. And when you, you, you need to use DMAs or service areas, and when you add them up, you get what's called the bottom-up estimate of leakage. So uh, uh, what we do, uh, we, we estimate that leakage on the DMA. One of the problems now is adding that up to get an estimate for the company as a whole. And one of your problems is, is that number correct? And there's usually a process we call an operability test, which gives us a, a level of confidence on the quality of that data and should we use it or not. And then, but we have to then estimate leakage on non-operable DMAs. So where the data is not correct, it looks as though we've got a breach on the DMA, we can't trust the number, we've got to make an estimate of the leakage on them. Then we have to make an estimate on leakage on areas which are not covered by DMAs. There may be small outlying uh, properties which are not metered, uh, not measured by in a DMA, so we have to make an allowance for those. Then we have to make an uh, assessment, uh, uh, allowance for leakage on our trunk mains, uh, our system upstream of our DMAs. What I'm trying to get to here is showing you that even if you say, oh, we'll estimate leakage from our night flows, that in itself produces a lot of problems. So the bottom line is we have two ways of estimating leakage, but neither of them are perfect. And so what we tend to do is I would t tend to recommend that you actually preferably use both methods of assessing leakage and try and compare the two and see how different they are. And from that, you can get a proper estimate of what your leakage is. The best way of doing uh, com comparative performance is usually you tend to use for intercompany comparison annual volumes at company level. Uh, and generally speaking, that gets over some of the issues. Um, within a company, you may get, might be more, you're now interested into smaller areas, so you're now be maybe talking about a water resource zone or something like that. Um, you may also now be interested in moving down, obviously, your tracking performance so you may be more interested now in looking at monthly data and seeing how things are uh, improving. 
when we start moving to how do we compare performance, and we talked, I've talked about scaling being a problem, uh, a bigger company will have bigger leakage. So um, a lot of people tend to use percentage of system input. It's very common. It's a set, often used by the non-technical, the media, the public, and what have you, because they believe it's understandable. They believe they can compare our performance to say the performance of Marks and Spencer. So they might say, oh, well, you lose 30% of your product, whereas Marks and Spencer's only lose 2% of their product through damages and what have you. And therefore, you must be not doing your job properly. And so they love that sort of thing. But really, one, we uh, on, the, on the IWA group attempt to move, try and pre encourage anybody to stop using percentages as much as possible. You should not uh, use percentages what, whatsoever. And one of the main things is it discourages water efficiency. So uh, one of your problems is, if I would say, if you want to, uh, if I've got, say, leakage of 20%, and I, you want to judge my performance and I want to improve that performance, the best bet is I go on the television that night and I tell everybody to go home and run the taps. Please run your taps 24 hours a day. Water, water demand will go through the roof, production level will go up, my, my leakage expresses a percentage will drop dramat dramatically. I will probably go from 20% leakage to 5% leakage. Now, is that good? No, it isn't. It's horrendous. I haven't changed leakage, and, uh, and the water coming out of our reservoirs is enormous. The corollary of that is, is uh, say, happening in uh, Cape, Cape Town and South Africa at the moment. They're in a mammoth water efficiency drive, reducing, reducing uh, demand from people and the amount of water they're using. If you're Generally speaking, what will happen is the leakage performance, if it's judged by in percentage terms, will actually be degenerating. It will look as though it's deteriorating and going worse. But in fact, leakage took, the people could be in the leakage department will be working very hard, leakage will be coming down, but in, when they're judging in percentage terms, it will look as that they are deteriorating. And uh, there is a sort of... Uh, a technical term for that is called a zero-sum game, uh, which means that basically, if one goes up, the other must come down, because the sum is 100%. So, uh, and the, one of the other problems we have is that in different systems, I've got different characteristics, and people may have different uh, cultures, and therefore, their, their use is different, and therefore, when you judge leakage on that basis, you get different answers. A typical example is, is this curve here, which shows that although uh, on this curve, the leakage level, when you, uh, expressed in liters per connection per day, is exactly the same in all these countries, but they all have different percentages, and that's because the amount of base consumption they have used by customers is quite different, and this number of connections. So, uh, for example, You'll see on the right-hand side here, we have a Singapore will quote a performance of about 3%, leakage of 3%. Aren't I very good? Whereas up at where I live, in England and Wales, our, our performance is 25%. Aren't they atrocious in England? They're hopeless. They've no idea how to do leakage management. In fact, the leakage level is exactly the same. It's just that the systems are different and the consumption levels are different. Uh, so one of, one of the uh, ways of getting over that is to express your leakage in terms of, say, litres per property or litres per connection. It would be better if it was litres per connection, but generally speaking, utilities do not record the number of connections. What they tend to have is it's relatively easy to go to their billing system and say how many properties are they billing. So they tend to express it as in litres per property, built properties. So it, it is recommended by the IWA uh, specialists uh, and uh, as a preferred technical measure for uh, looking at uh, 
uh, leakage performance and particularly tracking leakage performance. But one of the problems is that it's not recommended for very rural areas. If you're not careful, uh, rural areas have long lengths of mains, very few properties, and it looks as though their performance is not very good. I always had that problem where I worked because I had two very big cities, Liverpool and Manchester, you know, Manchester United and Liverpool Football Club, yeah. So I, I go, <laughs> well, we don't talk about Manchester City. No. And so, <laughs> and, uh, and so I got two big cities, Liverpool and Manchester, and yet, and then up at the top end of the region, I have a very, very rural area called the Lake District, where everybody goes for the holidays, they've got big mountains and all that sort of stuff. Beautiful, very stringy network. You know, very long lengths of mains, very few properties. So whenever I then tried to judge performance between the, the guys that were operating in Manchester to those in the, in the Lake District, I would always get the argument, oh, well, that's easy, but they've got... They've got lots of properties. When you express it as leaders' property, their, their performance looks good. So you just have to be a bit careful in using leaders' property in very rural areas. And so that's when sometimes people will, um, will go to lengths of mains. And so they express uh, performance in, say, meter cube per kilometer per day. Uh, I think the Germans are particularly uh, a favorite for them. Uh, and that's not very good then for the cities. That, that, mean, that, that makes it look as though uh, their performance is, is, uh, is, is poor. So you get torn between those two. So one way would be perhaps, can I compare two? And, and one of the ways that uh, our, the regulator in the United Kingdom did, he said, well, I'll put... I'll draw a graph of both litres per property in one direction and metre cube per kilometre in the other direction. And I'll get now a splatter of points. And, and so this is what he got. He got, he got when, it, when we compare the companies in England and Wales, you've got litres per property along the bottom, metre cube per kilometre per day on the top, and you get this splatter. Now, what, one thing you can definitely say is that for any that are basically along a line, the, the, the slope of where you are compared to the origin is the density of your network. The denser the network, the higher up this way you are, the rural, more rural your network, the down here. So these companies, that, that's like, dare I say, Thames, Thames Water, our most dense net, uh, water company. Very rural, I think that might be Northern Ireland very rural um, uh, area. So what you can say is, for anybody, if you draw a straight line on here, those that are further away from the origin than those are, have a higher leakage. So you can say that leakage there is higher than this. This guy has got the same density of network as you. Why can he perform here and you're up there? It's a bit more difficult when you're at a different angle. And so... The actual lines of equal leakage are, in fact, curves like this. So, in practice, this guy is up slightly better than that guy. Um, so, uh, and a way, a, diffi a way of avoiding the problems of how, how, how to still judge that performance might be to add like an allowance for the length of the communication, the service pipe from the main to the property to your length of mains. And that, some people do that. I don't particularly, it's not very common. I wouldn't particularly recommend it. And you have a slight downside. Do you, do you keep it the same? Uh, one meter of service pipe is the same as a meter of uh, mains length, or should you have a rate, different ratio? weight. So, so that, that's the problem of scaling. Then we get to the issue of explanatory factors. Uh, and typical explanatory factors are uh, pressure 
Uh, I, I mentioned that at the beginning, the fact that some guy says, I've got to put my water over the hill so my pressures are higher, therefore my leakage is going to be higher. And, or uh, I used to get it all the time. Manchester and Liverpool, they'd say, oh, but our, my infrastructure is the oldest in the company, so it bursts more, so um, my leakage is bound to be higher than, than somebody else's. Uh, they get problems of cost of water, but like up in Scotland, we've got plenty of water. I don't need to do worry about leakage because my cost of water is very, very low. Uh, I don't have any security or supply issues, so therefore I shouldn't have to do as much on leakage control. So there are two, there are two approaches to taking into account explanatory factors. One is you either take them into account but the whole problem of doing that, if you're not careful, is what, what it does is it disincentivizes the, those people to improve their performance in that measure. Come into that in a bit more detail if I have enough time. But so for example, if you take pressure into account in your assessment of their performance, what that does is it disincentivizes that particular manager to reduce pressure and improve his performance on pressure. So you do have to be quite careful in taking explanatory factors into account. Uh, another way of handling it is to perhaps split up your company into saying, well, this area here has got like, is high pressure, but uh, rural, and then this area here is urban and low pressure, and you create different cohorts of zones and companies or, or operators, and compare their performance. But generally speaking, you run out of, 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 of you know, different numbers of uh, zones that you can count in each of those groups of cohorts, and therefore comparing performance becomes very difficult. So that's what I meant by population. It's, it's not population in terms of people, but population in numbers of samples, uh, zones that you have in each of your cohorts. So how did we get over that? Well, the way you get over that is a thing called the Infrastructure Leakage Index. And at this point, we all go, yeah. And we, we pray, we get great homage to a person called Alan Lambert who developed this concept, uh, uh, working with the members on the Water Loss Task Force back in about, well, 2000, 1999, 2000. And the, the whole concept is to, to, to actually develop the idea that, that we cannot get away from having some level of leakage. And we have what we can class as an unavoidable level of leakage. And the level of unavoidable level of leakage can, is a function of the size of your network, your length of mains, number of connections, where, you're, where you build compared to somebody else. And and what, what, what Alan did then was develop a formula which is based on standard allowances for background losses, which is based on length of mains, uh, the sort of uh, figures for burst frequency which Ken showed you earlier, and flow rates, and all that. We put all that into a little sort of washing machine and a mixer, and we can come out with an allowance which says, Based on our length of mains, number of connections, you sh your unavoidable level of losses is given by that formula. And, and then what you do is you ex work out your, your own current level of leakage and expresses a ratio of your, the unavoidable level of leakage. And that is a ratio, it's called the infrastructure leakage index. Basically, it's a nice simple measure. If if your performance is good, because it's based on well-managed, a system in good condition where it's well-managed, you will have a ratio of one. You might even just beat one. Generally speaking, it's very hard to beat one. But if you've got numbers much bigger, then you're not doing very well. And these are some of the sort of numbers you get. These are global, global ILIs, and we'll have some, some doing better than uh, one, but generally speaking, you find that when you get into those, they are very small systems. Um, 
And then, then you've got some countries where the numbers are something like four or five. When we, members of the group and what have you, start doing leakage control and visit various parts of the world, we might find numbers like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. So where the leakage is 70 times higher than it ought to be on a particular system. Um, what are the measures? If, if you have a, a, a high ILI, what are the message, measure, messages? And the message is active leakage control. It's what, um, what Ken called backlog of leaks. Basically, usually it's an enormous backlog of un, uh, unreported, i.e. leaks that are not surfacing, that are sat out there on the system, running all the time. You just have to go out there and find them. Yeah. Uh, the, pro the one slight disadvantage with the ILI, but you have to take it into account, is pressure is, is taken into account. So if you're not careful, it disincentivizes you to do pressure. But it, that, you, there are ways around that. But the main measure, you don't, you can't, introducing pressure management will reduce your leakage, but probably not change your ILI. It's very common to have something like an ILI of 10, poor leakage. You think, right, I'll go do pressure management. You go in, you do a load of pressure management, your leakage level comes down in volumetric terms, but when you express it as an ILI, it will stay the same because the unavoidable losses has come down because pressure is taken into account. So uh, don't get disappointed if that happens. You've saved a lot of water, don't worry. Uh, it just means that you probably have to still do some active leakage control as well. Uh, and so, Canadian ILIs, I thought I'd throw this in for Ken. Um, so, uh, some down there, a few, uh, less than one, but we've got some here with uh, an ILI of about 14. And you'll notice here we have what we call the World Bank bands, which give you a feeling for what your performance is like based on your ILI. And basically, uh, you'll see there that if you've got an ILI between 8 and 16, this is for a developed country, then the World Bank would say that's very high leakage performance. You should do something about it. There's ladies in the room, so I won't say what I was going to say. <coughs> um, uh, and so, just a, a quick resume there of the, because I think the presentations are going to be circulated to people, aren't they? So, a quick resume there of the different performance measures I've, I've covered and why you can use them in some areas and not use them. But basically, the only one that gets a yes in all the, in all the boxes is ILI. Um, I won't go through. I'm sorry, I, we've, this, when you'll see this, this is a, an example uh, from South Africa, I can't pronounce it, is it Ilibi? Um, where the use of percentages has been used, and it shows that but when, because they drove leakage down but they're in a drought, that in fact it looked as though their performance has not improved, their leakage performance has not improved, but in fact, if you use the proper measures, then leakage performance has improved quite significantly. Because uh, one of the problems they had is they had the problem that they had a drought, so they ended up with uh, water, water restrictions, so their consumption comes down, looks as though leakage performance is deteriorating. So, um, I, 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 it'd be too, can't cover it really. And, and so there is this thing called the zero sum indicator, and there is a piece of software that you can get which will just show how by uh, improving your water efficiency, it will look as though your leakage performance is deteriorating. Uh, I talked about the fact that ILI takes pressure into consideration, so you can actually take that into account by actually using the concept of a pressure management index 
and simply expressing your leakage as, a, say, a ratio of a standard pressure in your country, and therefore compare perf poor performance. And you can then get a sort of two-dimensional graph. Uh, oh, sorry. So if I've, I've got ILI this way and pressure management index this way, if you're high in pressure, then you should do with something with pressure management. If you're high in ILI, you should do something with active leakage control. If you're high in both, then you need to do active leakage control and pressure management. Uh, and I think there are, so I mentioned them earlier about cost of water. Personally, that is like uh, the sort of thing that you might do in 20, when you get down to an ILI of less than two, then you start worrying about the economics and should it drive leakage any lower, really. Uh, and if you're not careful, uh, uh, you do can get into very complicated calculations with not a lot of value, to be honest. Uh, so, uh, shouldn't use percentages at all, uh, sh should really be abandoned once and for all. But uh, it's a name that we all have, but I think we'll, we're still struggling with people that define non-revenue water contracts to actually stop using percentages. Um, but that's something that we sign up to do and we will continue to do wherever we can. Um, so, one of the there's difficulties, there's no real single measure. There are, you know, combination of ILI and pressure indices, liters per connection, Use the one that's appropriate. Oh, be very careful using explanatory factors, because if you take explanatory factors into account, it will, di will disincentivize people from improving their performance in that measure. Uh, ILI is recommended by the IWA Water Loss Steering uh, Specialist Group, uh, if we still go that, are we? Yeah. Uh, it can be used to, be, to set targets, but be careful of pressure, of course. Uh, there are some <laughs> fancier techniques called frontier approach, and I think, uh, well, I gave a paper at, um, at Manila on that, if people are interested in that, in, in setting targets for different, uh, say, areas in your company, or different utilities within a country, without totally disincentivizing, uh, turning some people off. I mean, one of the problems with ILI, if you're not careful, you work out a particular uh, a company or area has got an ILI of 20, and you say you should I have an ILI of two, i.e. Uh, reduce your leakage to a tenth of what it is, and immediately it like, turns them off because it's this blue haze of how on earth do I get from here to here. One advantage of the frontier approach is it's sort of like will gradually move you down your performance, uh, keep m judging you against how the better person within your company is operating. And that tends to keep motivation levels higher. Must recommend that you use standard processes and definitions have to be used all the time. Thank you very much. <laughs>